present. Yes, uh, they won't see that. I'll, do, I'll oh, try and get the list. Yeah, I know. I'll try and get rid of it. Okay, click the X. Yeah, it's gone. <clears throat> okay. So, Eat with his IT skills. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the council and staff and try. Sorry, let me start again. The council and trade union joint committee. We've been called a number of things over the years, and that is why I uh, misread it. Um, Welcome. Um, I've got to say I've got quite a few apologies. Some people have got COVID, some people have um, just come back into the country, but uh, let's soldier on and continue. Um, should we um, dispense with the apologies for absence and uh, agree that I give uh, the names to Keith? Um, I don't believe there's any urgent matters to be discussed. And I don't believe there are any declarations of interest either. Great. And there are no matters to be considered in private. So should we go through the minutes? Sorry. But, Chair, I probably do actually need to, I do now need to make a declaration of interest as I have recently been appointed to be an employer representative on the NJC for local government services. So I imagine at various points we may discuss that. I don't believe it's prejudicial interest and I propose to stay for duration of the discussion. No, and I, I can confirm that I don't uh, believe that to hinder your attendance or your contributions either. And I think it will be very helpful for you to be on the employer's side because it may assist us in getting information and potentially some positive changes. So thank you for that. Um, let's go straight into the minutes um, and I'll take them page by page and I'm going to zip through these to save time because uh, the meeting took place on the 14th of June, uh, 2022, and that was some time ago. So page one, page two, page three, Page four, page five, page six. Um, at the bottom of page six, it's about regarding the pay claim. As we're all aware, the, the, there has now been a pay agreement. So we're just going to ask quickly for confirmation of when the payment, the first uh, payment will be made, and also when the back pay would also be paid, please. And I see Sue's looking eagerly. So could you please confirm that, please? It's Andrew's team, so I'm going to let him answer. <laughs> uh, with the microphone, probably. Yes, the Teachers Pay Award, the intention mm -hmm. is to uh, implement it in November. The corporate pay award, which includes school support staff, the intention is to implement that in December. Thank you, Andrew. And does that include the back pay as well? Yes, it includes the back pay. Sorry, there were concerns about people who were in receipt of universal credit, how this would Im impact negatively on upon them and i understand but it's, there's nothing that the council can do not in terms of the, the system the system calculates the back pay and so and also we don't know who is on universal credit so the system unfortunately doesn't allow us to do that subminder okay could Perhaps if we could discuss outside of a meeting if there are any individuals that do come forward who would be um, disbenefited from having lump sums paid whilst they're in receipt of universal credit, we, we could talk about those individual uh, cases and see what we can do. Certainly, yes. Okay, thank you. 
moving on to page seven, page eight, page nine, and I take it that those minutes are agreed. Yeah, thank you. And let's move on to the employee side items. And um, essentially, should we break this up in terms of uh, talking about the uh, council budget of where we're at and taking the other issues separately? So because the council budget is of enormous interest to us because it's uh, where we are, is there a deficit, how we're going to deal with the deficit and how how we're looking forward to uh, providing services, particularly in the new financial year as well. So I'll hand over to you, Peter. Um, actually, if you want to take the council budget first, I'll defer to Councillor Donnelly. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the um, disadvantages of my role is one increasingly feels like a harbinger of doom and invitations to parties get fewer uh, and fewer as my conversation gets more uh, monomaniacal. Uh, I'll take it in two parts, really. One is how we're doing in terms of the current year and then how are things looking uh, moving forward. Um, at the Cabinet meeting in September, I think it was, um, I reported that um, we were running at that point um, deficit uh, for the year in the region of fifteen million pounds, getting on for like five percent um, of budget. Um, and I explained, you know, the the challenges we were facing, particularly in adults and children's services, where the demand continues to rise, but the funding doesn't keep pace with it, despite all of the initiatives and hard work that are. Uh, teams are putting into uh, finding ways to make more from uh, less. Um, I'm uh, hopeful. I, I expect to be able to report an improved picture for quarter two um, at the December. Sorry, at the yes, in January. I think the no. Wait, my my next report to cabinet on budget, which will be in December. Um, I expect to report a better position, um, but it's a very tumultuous situation. Uh, the, the national economic picture is, you know, I, I'm not as young as I used to be, and I feel I can use the word unprecedented uh, with, a, with a degree of, of confidence. So um, we're, we remain hopeful we're, we're going to be able to push us ourselves towards a a, a balanced position at the end of the year as far as future years are concerned well you know i suppose the last few months have been a tale of diminishing optimism um then giving way to increasing pessimism um it, it's no secret what seems to be trailed in all of the papers around the financial statement forthcoming on the 17th of november is that we're going to see a return to some kind of Tory austerity. Um, and we know here in local government that that's absolutely the last thing that we need or or can cope with. Um, we're having enough difficulty as it is um, keeping vital services going without any reduction in the money that's coming our way. So uh, all parts of local government all parties in local government ha have been pushing very hard to ensure that uh, the new, the once and the once future and current Secretary of State Michael Gove understands the need to to keep funding at an appropriate level. What remains to be seen is what level of influence he has within this week's, this month's um, cabinet under this week's this month's prime minister um but it's very difficult to take a, a cheerful view uh, at the moment i guess it's it is a very difficult situation uh, i'm wondering if um jeremy hunt's announcement in the, the next week or two 
is going to have um, any potential impacts. But equally, um, we are wary and we don't want to be looking directly at staff in terms of savings. Um, I think that is a, that's a wrong thing to do because your staff are obviously your biggest assets. They're the ones that actually deliver the service. It's not because of masses of resources. It's because of a diligent and committed work that they do for the residents of this authority and for this council. And, um, you know, to be uh, going for reorganizations is a, is a smack in the teeth after all of the loyalty that people have shown. So I hope we are not going down that road at all. Well, well, absolutely, and I think um, Councillor Mason will will add it in in terms of where we stand on structure. But I don't think there's anything between us on this. We know that we can't deliver the services we need to deliver without the people who, who do it and who do it um, so diligently uh, day after day. Of course, we'll keep pressing to find ways to do those things better and to do more things and to do those things well and perhaps you know, to to phase out or stop doing some things that we have done in the past. That's just the the cycle of life. Um, it's the cycle of local government services. But we're not looking at a situation where we think, oh yeah, we're we we're just knee deep in surplus staff, and so let let's move them on. That's that's not the world we're in at all. Uh, I think we are uh, united in this committee in seeing the world that way. I mean, I suppose the only thing I'd really add is that, you know, um, as is always the case, I mean, the, the interesting thing about Michael Gove being back at DLUC is, of course, that when he was there, what, three months, three months ago, um, he was promising us um, a two-year settlement for um, local government. So give us at least an indication from DLUC and from the Treasury what that, that when we put together a medium-term financial strategy, which of course we're legally obliged to do, and indeed that's the process through which we demonstrate that we can balance our books. Um, you know, the, I'm sure if you get into the actual accounting of the MTFS, it's uh, an interesting document, but it, it, it's the one that we have to work within. Um, we would have had a greater assurance in terms of decisions that we could take now, but of course the intervening sort of three five month period has meant that all of some of the main assumptions about forecasting and business planning are now upended because we're facing interest rates and inflation at rates that hitherto we we wouldn't have ever anticipated being the case um you know and uh, you know it's not to be overly political but but they are as a direct consequence of government action and government decisions that have been taken over the last six weeks so in, in an incredibly short period of time you know we've gone as a council from and, and i think believe this was in the um this was in the budget report we've gone from a situation in which we believed that um an efficiency target of 38 million pounds was the worst case scenario on the basis that the government perhaps might have given us less money than um, in previous years and with the economic sort of um, indicators being where they are, to so £38 million now being the realistic scenario for um, what we're going to need to find. Now, as ever, as, as Councillor Donnelly sort of clearly outlined, that will, of course, come from trying to do things in, in better ways um, and maintaining what it is that we've got and the fantastic staff who, who do that. Um, uh, the bulk remainder of, of 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 that may well be difficult decisions that are going to be, need to be taken in the context of having to set a balanced budget. We won't know the scale of the decision that we need to take until both the government have come forward with the um, with the budget statement, but also the local government settlement, which we're not anticipating. We wouldn't anticipate it anyway until December. But invariably, given the sort of the chaos that we've seen in the last few weeks, I wouldn't, you know, I would not be surprised if it's not until um, the early part of next year. So, you know, as ever in budget cycles, we will continue to prepare for both the worst case scenario and the realistic scenario, um, and hope that the preparations that we make won't won't have to be implemented. But I'm afraid, um, I'm afraid, the scale of the situation that we face this this year because of what we've seen in the last six weeks is, um, I'm afraid to say, very dire. Um, and George Osborne is back in 
the Treasury advising Jeremy Hunt on um, macroeconomic policy. And the last time George Osborne was in charge of macroeconomic policy, it was the first round of austerity that cost us £160 million worth of um, our um, of our budget. And, and I think we all know what, what, that, what that's done to us over the last 12 years. Thank you. I'll throw it open for those who are beaming into this meeting. Does anyone want to contribute? So, Kaminda, Adam has his hand up. Okay, thank you. Sorry, the, the screen's so small, I can hardly see Sorry. it. Adam, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening. Just a couple of um, points. One, it, it just, uh, and just, we're all obviously united in our dread in terms of the financial statement and the potential local government settlement this year, and following on from that prospect of a return to austerity, two percent pay rise for public sector workers next year, etc. I mean, there's, there's, we're in a strange position where. The, the the jobs market is such that the actually retaining staff is 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 a difficulty at the moment given the amount of vacancies there are across all sectors of the economy, uh, and that's and local government's not uh, um, you know aside from that the two the two points I wanted to make was just in terms of um, the the process because I, I, whether this is right or wrong the it had been rumoured that the approach was going to be or suggested the approach was going to be going forward that services would have to find savings from their own departments rather than looking across the council for savings. But maybe that was based on a lower figure of savings and that might change uh, if, the, if the figure is higher. Just a question, question on that. And the, and the second point is just in terms of process, in the recent past, when we've had large savings to make, the, the trade unions, uh, employers, and I think even you know officers presenting uh, budget proposals have found it's uh, beneficial to have a corporate consultation process which provides accountability um, and transparency in a, in a more uniform way than individual services doing their own thing at their own time. And I would urge the council to, co to consider return to corporate consultation uh, if we're talking about large scale budget cuts. Uh, Councillor Donnie might want to come in, in on this. Um, uh, we 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 are taking sort of this round of budget in two different ways. So of course there will remain corporate sponsor programs that previously people might have recognised under the future Ealing banner that do look at how we deliver services and the, our ability to deliver services in different and better ways that have ultimately benefits for for residents. Um, th th those um, those budget efficiencies do derive savings. And they will be still held corporately and, and that work is ongoing. We're not quite in the stage of we're still sort of kicking the tires on some of those initial proposals to actually demonstrate whether or not that they can make a contribution to the corporate saving. There, there is also a shift in terms of the way that we are handling both budget monitoring and budget accountability. Um, in the organisation overall, and perhaps we'll speak to it when we come to the, um, the strategic leadership team um, in terms of the changes that, that have been happening corporately um, with the new um, Section 151 officer and, and director of um, uh, and, and the director of finance, which is um, in order to really be able to drive savings within the organisations where they need to be made, of course, in proper consultation and openly and um, without sort of detrimental impact, um, our senior leaders right across the organisation um, need to be accountable for their budgets. And in order to be accountable for their budgets, they actually need to control them. So um, we, we are looking across the board at making sure our financial processes and systems are as good as that they can be, and that where individual managers are budget line holders and responsible for budgets, that they um, have the latitude to be able to operate within that budget and, and drive both the service and the savings that they need to. I think where we have been in the past is that um, quite often too much financial, too much centralised financial dis uh, decision making um, can sometimes lead to disempowerment at a service level, both in terms of people doing sensible things as well as making as well as making savings. So, so that work is ongoing. Um, but I think in terms of the corporate consultation, I mean, of course, any budget proposal that we bring forward has to have public consultation, and um, particularly if it's uh, significant changes to the way that services are run will have it and in terms of an impact to the public. Um, and I'm, I'm certain that, that corporate um, that corporate consultation would, would would work, if not before that, in tandem with it. Councillor Donnelly? 
Yes, I mean, we'd certainly honour all of our traditional ways of consulting with our unions. Kind that How we do it, kind of conditioned by what sort of situation we find ourselves in. Um, you know, yeah, there's, there's still, you know, I'm trying to portray myself as a, a sort of raging optimist, um, but there is a spectrum of possible outcomes. Um, we, from not too bad through to, um, I think I said to uh, colleagues, you know, where you're looking for the in case of emergency break glass hammer, you know, and in those situations, nobody um, is can feel in, in a in a comfortable position. Um, you know, we we have always, even in difficult times, um, services have always been able to put forward growth bids for for key areas, and, and even in bad times, there are services that that we have expanded, and that that's right because you need to work out what needs to be done more, what needs to be done better. Also, in my view, even in the worst of times, you you need for issues of basic morale, you need to show as an organisation that you're able to look outwards, you're able to look to the future, you're able to grow services as well as to, to shrink them. Um, so organ- so services put in bids for growth, but, but we also ask them to look at themselves in terms of efficiency, you know, genuinely efficiency saving. What can you, how can you set about identifying the things that actually not many people will notice if we stop doing. Not many people will be disadvantaged if we stop doing, or we can do those things in a different way in order in order to save money. But then to side with that, and this is where really not until certainly the 17th of November, and probably uh, as the leader says, not until January into February when the final um, settlement comes through, will we know what contribution services may have to make to a 38, 48, 58 million pound deficit for the year. And, and as everyone in this committee knows, one of the one of the disadvantages that we have in local government is that we are required to balance our books through our budget every single year. You know, we can't project ahead, we can't run a deficit for two years with a view to breaking even through an investment program in year three, the way that um, the way that a business might do, or the way that central government uh, in, enables itself to do, um, we're not able to do that. So we have to budget for balance, and that makes life very, very difficult when times are very, uh, very hard as they appear possibly to be likely to be. But um, I guess what I'd say is the more serious the situation we find ourselves in the more centralised I would think the nature of the consultation between us would be. Good, thank you. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you, that, that was helpful, but um, obviously we're in that unknown scenario, which, which I fully appreciate. There is a, um, a day-to-day difficulty with um, increasing demand, particularly within children and adults, uh, and it's trying to stem that demand and to deal with that demand, but um, it's a difficult job to close it down at the front door. So uh, again, with austerity, because I think it's already here, you know, and uh, with uh, the cost of living, etc., uh, people's mental health, etc., that means that there's going to be more demands for our services. Yeah, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to to get that but um it, it is a, a very difficult juggling act to to do that and to secure um the balanced budget which we appreciate it's about how confident we are or how we're feeling uh, about being able to do that um obviously you're legally required to set a balanced budget, but uh, in the event, and I hope we don't get there, that there are going to be staffing proposals. Perhaps we can have a discussion prior to 
those decisions being made. So at least we've got the the heads up, and we've uh, we've we've and we can discuss the appropriate consultation process as well. That will be really helpful. But again, I state I wish I, I wish and I hope we're not going to be there. Yeah. I think we're done with that, and I can't see any other hands up. Should we move on to the um, change and structural review and any other initiatives? Obviously, we're aware, and I'm going to take part of your, part of your statements away because I'm aware that we have a new chief executive who's been around for, for some time now. We've uh, got interim uh, strategic directors, six of them, we understand we've gone out to the uh, municipal journal on a spread on Ealing and the attractiveness of Ealing to encourage interest and uh, people to uh, apply to working at Ealing, but in particular for these positions of strategic directors. We've gone with uh, three positions of strategic directors, and later on we will go with another three uh, the concern amongst the staff within the council is what is going to happen to the people below? Are, the, are they going to be moved from directorate to a directorate as time goes on? How are they going to be impacted? Uh, is there going to be reorganizations? What is going to happen? Also, the cost of this is of concern to a number of staff as well, because we understand there will be staff who are either leaving or whatever, but the overall cost appears for many that if this is not going to be a cost-neutral proposal. It's going to be expensive. It's going to... Um, may involve some severance costs as well, redundancy and whatever. And uh, obviously, there's an impact on, on the pension scheme as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm a, that's of interest to me as well. Um, but it's really your staff are wondering what's going to happen to them and how are they going to be working? Are they going to change practices or what's going to happen to them? Peter. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is that um, in terms of the review of both the strategic leadership team, um, you know, all stems from the decisions that we took as an early administration about the type of council that we want to be, that is responsive to um, the public, that's open, transparent and inclusive in the way that it operates, and responsive to the mandate that the good people of Ealing give each administration as we are elected on a, on a four-year cycle. And we, we took a series of decisions as an early administration that in order to get to the situation that we wanted to get to, that we wanted to review once again, um, as you know, I think we, we came to know them, the super directorates of people in place to test whether or not that we were actually getting what we needed to from the structure of the organisation. Um, and we went through the process of engaging staff um, far and wide in the preparing for change uh, consultations that um, uh, that Sue and others um, were, were sort of brought into the council to help us deliver and that surface as I'm sure you will recall many of the themes and culture and value statements that the um, both staff aspired to but also could describe the council being at the time um, and, and that really has formed the basis of the early set of um, proposals that were implemented as you've described them in terms of the senior leadership team the, the strategic leadership team as it will now become um, the the working assumption actually with the flattening and the deletion of a layer of um, uh, uh, director posts is actually that the that once we're at the conclusion of the process um, in MTFS terms, i.e. in the council's revenue position, it will actually be a net saving. Um, we will spend less on uh, senior leadership posts than we did um, before we um, came in as an administration. Um, but we will have a, a better structure that's more responsive to the needs of the organisation and the needs of the public. What, um, as you rightly say, we're now going through the process of the recruitment of those um, strategic directors. Um, we're starting with children's services, with um, uh, change and, um, and strategy, um, as well as um, economy. We hope to have those in place, or at least decisions made on the recruitment by um, the end of the calendar year with the remaining three posts um, advertised and recruited in the early first quarter of um, the next calendar year also. 
Um, we're also doing some work both with the cabinet and with the interim um, strategic directors to start, start to start modeling the behavior that we want to see in the rest of the organization, i.e. working across silos, working across boundaries and finding new and innovative ways to deliver. So cabinet and SLT have its first way day properly um, that's now scheduled for the beginning of January after the conclusion of the first round of, of interviews. And again, that's really designed to start opening up a more responsive and transparent and inclusive conversation across the political leadership of the organization, as well as the um, organizational management of the organization. Um, what will, of course, happen is once we've onboarded our strategic directors, they may well want to, in the conversation that happened as part of the consultation around the strategic leadership team, think about whether the alignments are correct and you know we had an original consultation that tried to test in the organization people's willingness to think about different ways of doing things for example as part of that consultation we suggested that the um, housing demand um, might be better placed um, sitting with adult services it's a model that's used in different parts of london um, our neighbors in brent for example um, have that model and the response from the consultation was actually probably um, that's not the right fit for Ealing, and therefore that that didn't that didn't happen. That didn't take place. But it may well be in two, three, five, ten years' time that the needs of the organisation do change, and therefore, of course, we will be responsive to it. So those strategic directors will come on board, and they will want to, as I'm sure, test within um, their particular bits of the organisation that we are sort of fighting fit to be able to deliver on on um, what the administration has has set them to has set this task to do. Um, but of course, what I would hope is, if and when that happens, if indeed, if it does, um, we would engage with um, staff and we would engage with the trade unions to the extent that we have, um, if not more so, through the process of, of time for change and also through the conversations that I know that you, you've sort of been um, having with both Tony and Sue um, through the course of the recruitment of the of the strategic leadership team. Thank you. Um, I guess what I'm really saying is st staff are concerned and I think communications about what's happening would be really good. I think um, some directors, um, assistant directors and heads of service are, are concerned about their future and whether or not they feature within the new look of Ealing. So, um, you know, and that permeates all the way through as well. So I think it'll be really quite helpful if there's um, assurances and uh, confidence given to people. Steve? Yeah. We have no, we haven't gone into this for the purposes of pushing people out that's not not what this is about um i think employees of the council who've been around a few years will have seen a few variations of structure um a few organizational designs and you know we know that organizational design is not in itself a solution it can be an obstruction you know as circumstances change a particular form of organisation can cease to be able to deliver the kind of effective, um, dynamic, responsive um, approach that we increasingly need to have. And I think that's pretty clearly what was clear. And it was interesting when Paul Martin came in as interim chief executive, I think almost one of his very first perceptions about the then structure at the executive leadership structure, he didn't get it. You know, and I, I think Tony has come in and his position was very much the same. So we, it's not that that was a bad model. It's just a model that stopped being fit for purpose for us now. So the consultation around a broader based senior leadership team of six, any bigger, it seems to me, would be in danger of getting too big. But everybody who's key to the organisation has literally has a seat at that table, you know, and, and we think that's very important. We're not trying to manage the organisation. That's another important point. The chief executive will manage yeah. the organisation. Um, the, the, the terms of reference between us as the political leadership and the senior officerial leadership always have to be clear and always have to be respected um, and they will be 
they they will be respected. So uh, we are confident. And I, it was interesting because something you said about uncertainty, and it kind of took me back to something that Adam said earlier about the job market, about local government not being exempt <laughs> from the 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 pool of alternative roles. What we want to achieve is we want to make the borough a place that people want to stay working in and come to work in. Uh, and we'll achieve that by having good people, the right people in the very senior roles, working to the best effect with the rest of their teams and drawing in over a period a better and better and better management team to make the the organization more effective but it's not about bumping out people um who who currently work so hard for us <coughs> thank you steve um just wondering if anyone else wants to contribute and i can't see any hands up so should we move on to um the next item which is uh schools schools funding and the neu um should I just um, make some points and then you can uh, respond to those because we're all concerned about um, the news and what's been in the news now and in particular um, it's been on for a, a, a week or so now that schools are finding it difficult to, to uh, secure funding to ensure that they have sufficient funding for this financial year, let alone next financial year, uh, they, along with everyone else, is facing increases in, in costs, inflation, cost of goods, etc. And uh, what we're concerned about is that uh, schools in Ealing shouldn't automatically uh, embark upon cost-saving exercises and unfortunately, uh, what they what they have been doing across the country, and we don't want it to happen here in Ealing, is that they automatically go for job cuts, particularly with the support staff. So we want to send a clear message, which is, hold on, that shouldn't automatically happen. You should look at other cost-saving exercises. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that they should look at the teaching staff either. So it's not about us against them. It's about the, uh, the, the school, the service they provide, and how everyone is important and essential in providing those uh, services to the children and to the parents. So just want to put that message out for you. Um, the next thing is about the NEU, and unfortunately, it appears that the NEU are um, or were consulting non-teaching staff on the pay deal and uh, potentially balloting uh, the staff that they have members of uh, for uh, potential strike action. And we've said quite clearly. The NEU are not recognised by this council for uh, uh, as as a union for a support staff. It's only the GMB and Unison is the first point. The second point is is that the NEU are not even recognised by the National Joint Committee Stroke Council uh, nationally. So, you know, I'm I'm kind of scratching my head thinking how there could be uh, industrial action regard when you're not even recognised, and nor will they be recognised. But th this is uh, causing problems, and I think we need to dispel to the um, Smith with uh, staff in schools that should they be uh, consulted or balloted, that it it is not bony fide at all in any sense. Um, I'll stop with those two points and come back to the other points, but uh, I'll just uh, ask for a response, please. Yeah, so just on, on the overall position, obviously, with, with the school spending and the dedicated school grant, we, we obviously get a we get an allocation from government according to the national formula, and the national formula is then replicated locally in terms of how those allocations are made across schools. Um, we, we know that 
sort of 69 schools about 91 percent sort of closed at surplus balance um at the end of at the end of last year and i'm certain that head teachers and financial managers within schools will be thinking very carefully about their sort of financial position <laughs> for, for the following year um, we've obviously got the Ealing Learning Partnership that exists to be able to support schools across a range of different things, not least education um, and curriculum, but of course also on stability and, and infrastructure. And, and I'm certain that those conversations will will continue to happen. Um, in, in terms of sort of, we are of course we are aware of the um, of the uh, NEU dispute, as you rightly say, the NEU are not recognised by um, the council as um, being a representative a trade union of uh, uh, of support staff within schools and um as you rightly say that's both the situation um in the njc but also the our understanding here locally um my understanding though is, is that unison and the gmb have raised a dispute with the tuc um and therefore the tuc are now in the position that they will need to um uh they will need to arbitrate um that dispute um and and we'll wait to see what what the tuc's position position is um, Ealing continues to subscribe to the National um, Joint Council uh, for local government services. Um, so, you know, that is the position of, of the authority where we will continue to be um, attached to um, the NJC. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. Um, it's a bit surprising, but they they may they may potentially be uh, hoodwinking their members into thinking there could be a potential strike action. Particularly since we've already agreed the the twenty twenty two twenty three pay settlement. So it, I'm kind of scratching my head on that one. But never mind. Uh, if we move on, just to, chair, sorry, and just to say, I mean, I think. Once again, we are united in the belief that uh, schools should be funded for the settlements that are, that are reached. And if the government won't do that, it, it's going to create the kind of situation that you initially out, initially outlined. And I think we all we would all share the, the view that no school should rush to make anyone's job. Uh, redundant at the same time particularly those of us who are school governors are aware of what a large percentage of a school's budget is the employee cost so it, it's extremely difficult for us for a school that's in difficulty to to manage without addressing the issue of its employee costs and you know so we respect we have to we have to respect that while at the same time you know, obviously, as as a, as a council, we'll look to offer whatever support we can to schools uh, within Ealing, and if we can help um, in whatever way, then we'll do so. Thank you. Um, moving on, we've got um, I've been sent a, an email by Danny, and this is about um, the concern that school specific redeployment. Uh, list is still not in place. I believe he's meeting with Mark Nelson tomorrow, so he'll discuss this. But uh, in light of our discussion about school budgets and uh, reorganisations, I think it would be important that uh, schools uh, redeployment lists are are available, uh, F and E B. Um, also, it'd really be helpful for our. Um, our internal recruitment email that goes out um, to staff in, in, in corporately, if that were also to be made available to schools as well, to uh, and to school staff as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that from our perspective, those are matters agreed. And if there are challenges in the administration of those those issues, then I'm I'm sure Mark um, and Danny can can resolve them tomorrow. But as far as we're concerned, they're, they're matters agreed. Perfect, thank you. And um, the next issue is about um, a rising casework uh, from members being assaulted or intimidated by pupils since September. Uh, it's a high level now. Um, I believe Danny is going to talk to Mark about this, and it's about um, having discussions about what we can do to help them. You as councillors and cabinet, uh, what support will be placed through the Ealing Learnership, uh, Learning Partnership to help schools protect their staff from harm whilst they're at work 
and uh, ensuring uh, a safe working environment for the staff as well. So I just wanted to highlight that. I'm not going to ask for a response. I think we're all on the same page here, which is everyone's health and safety must be complied with and safety is uh, paramount for all of us. Um, but I think the last issue is really about um, Ealing being uh, catch, uh, contract compliant in terms of uh, real living wage across the school's contracts. Obviously, we're going to talk separately about uh, the, the care sector. Um, it's, and the last point is, um, are we Ealing compliant across all contracts with annual leave entitlements? And this is arising from a Brazil case that came in which was essentially and i'll just give a short version of it 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 basically said that staff who are part-time or uh, term-time workers shouldn't be discriminated and receive less um, annual leave and it shouldn't be pro rata they should have the, the full entitlement that their counterparts on, on full-time permanent posts were receiving so and um, I'd sort of, in in response both to the previous uh, point that you made um, about staff safety, I, I, I echo your views. I, I pride myself in most public meetings by being able to give a response rather than using the, the sort of the cliche of we'll take it back and, um, and we'll we'll come back to you. Um, and I never like using that phrase, but on, on that, given the specificity of, of the issue, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to take it away, and um, and I'm sure the team will will sort of take it and look at it and review it, come back, and and we can work out what what the situation is. But Steve, uh, also if Danny or anyone else ha has reason to believe that any particular supplier provider is not compliant, then obviously that would assist us and and fast track any any investigation into it. You are, I'll pass on that message to Danny. Can I just can I just say something? Yes, of course, Andrew. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So just on the Basel case, the specific case. So we are aware of that, and it is being discussed both in the uh, at London Councils in the HR Policy Network and also in the Schools Forum. Uh, given that the Basel case. Um, affects the whole of the public sector. Um, again, at Heads of HR tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to be asking whether there's going to be any national or provincial advice that comes out of that, because it's not only our authority which is affected. Yes, I, I, I think that's uh, that would be helpful. I think there needs to be a uniform application uh, ac across the public sector. I think that would be very good, but uh, and it also... Um, there are many areas where um, there are part-time workers, uh, not only in schools, but across uh, other areas that we uh, of services that we provide. So we just need to ensure that uh, it's a uniform application. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, moving on to the London Living Wage uh, update on implementation in the social care provision and Unison's ethical care charter. Um, I did this agenda some time ago. Uh, I have since received an email from Gordon Crichton, which um, outlined, and it's a broad email, the, the implementation, particularly within home care, um, but um, and the phasing of that implementation as well. We're going to ask for a detailed meeting to actually drill down on what uh, which employers we're dealing with and whatever. So we can jointly monitor the implementation as well. But uh, I, yeah, I'd like to ask you to give us a, a more general response as well, please. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the key sort of planks of the new administration was making sure that we were uh, London Living Wage compliant across all of our contracts. Um, of course, that stemmed from an initial conversation of the previous administration um, that had been identified via um, the school's catering contract, which of course was a joint contract by um, Ealing Schools that was facilitated via um, the sort of the council's uh, Ealing Learning Partnership and our procurement hub. 
But effectively, the review of all of our contracts surfaced, uh, you know, a number of circumstances in which we are still not London Living Wage compliant. Now, that is true for all local authorities in London. Um, there are, I don't believe that there is a single local authority, probably in London or perhaps even in the country, that can honestly put their hand on their heart and say that every contract that they um, are in uh, ensures that there is London Living Wage compliance. Um, but of course, that's not good enough. And certainly as an administration in Ealing, we've set out very clearly that we want to be in a position by the end of the administration that every contract uh, that the council is in uh, doesn't just protect London living wage, but also protects a range of um, employee rights and um, expectations around things, for example, like trade union representation in the workplace. Um, and that's part of the um, new social value policy that, uh, of course, we brought in last year and will continue to be under review. Um, what we were able to do at the beginning of this financial year as a new administration amending the uh, budget was to set aside funds to be invested in the um, domiciliary care worker contract or the home care contract. What that's enabled us to do in a very short period of time after some initial work through an incredibly great team who've been working on this around the clock um, is moved to an immediate implementation of London Living Wage for domiciliary care workers that will come into effect on the 14th of November. What that will do is um, through our contracting and procurement guarantee that every care provider who provides care to um, people in Ealing um, is receiving the uh, at least the London uh, living wage of eleven pounds and five pence per per hour on November the fourteenth. Um, in April, in line with um, the rise in the uh, real living wage uh, London wide, that will then again increase to eleven pounds and ninety five eleven pounds ninety five pence per hour, and we anticipate moving forward. Um, and we sort of, if you like, bake it into the medium term financial strategy that from that point onwards, we will also um, increase by whatever the um, rate of increase is for, for London, um, for the real living wage, London living wage from, from that year onwards. What we were also able to do at last cabinet in the contract extension for um, our uh, leisure services, our le leisure facilities, uh, was to indicate that from the point of the contract extension next year, Ealing will be moving to ensuring that all people by that contract are also paid um, the London living wage. It was a slightly more complex. Um, uh, it was a slightly more complex one. We're in a triborough arrangement with Harrow and with Brent. Um, neither Harrow or Brent had paid the London living wage through their contracts. Um, we were the, by far the largest of the participants of that triborough agreement. Um, Brent was a smaller player and, and Harrow is the medium. Um, thankfully, um, after our sort of direction of travel that we've given both to, to Harrow and to Brent, um, Brent have now determined that they will also um, become London Living Wage employers via their contract. Unfortunately, we've not been able to convince Harrow um, that they need to uh, join us on that one. Um, but that will be that will certainly be the case for Ealing uh, uh, people on the Ealing element of the contract from from next year onwards. Of course, the work continues to go through all of our remaining contracts um, uh, to be able to identify and deal with um, contract variations or the renewal of contracts where we aren't London Living Wage compliant. But it is now an expectation of every new contract that we do um, procure. So, for, for example. I know that Councillor Zismos was, was has been particularly interested in trees. Um, she, I'm sure, will be aware that we have now gone to uh, decide on five of our tree contracts. Those five tree contracts, just by virtue of being new contracts, have to be compliant with um, London Living Wage. Um, and we'll continue to do that um, over the lifespan of the administration. As we've talked about, I think, pretty much whenever we've discussed this item in previous meetings, there are some contracts that are more difficult than others. As a borough, we are, if you like, a net importer of people who come for residential um, nursing and um, home care, i.e. In, in sort of residential settings. The way that that market works is a pan-London market. Um, somebody from Camden or Islington or, or even, you know, Redbridge and Barking and Dagenham might decide that the appropriate place for their care is to be in a, an Ealing um, place. And if those boroughs aren't compliant with London Living Wage, at the same time that Ealing isn't, invariably what that means is 
that the rates that a local authority pays for the care for that individual don't get passported onto the um, don't get passported onto the people working in those care institutions. It's ultimately absorbed by for profit making um, organisations. So that work continues through the West London Alliance, certainly in the um, the uh, West London sort of sub regional procurement vehicle um and uh there's been changes in terms of political leadership of, of that organization and, and hopefully um we'll be able to broker it um through through west london i think what the what the harrow situation within the leisure contract has demonstrated is unfortunately we can be in a positive situation to want to right the wrongs of non-london living wage compliance um, but but there will be local authorities that don't wish to come on that journey with us. And what and the conversations with the uh, London citizens um, and um, regionally as well in terms of trade unions continue to try and find ways to put pressure and influence on on those who who don't want to come on that journey as as quickly as we want to go on it. Thank you. I'm sure our discussions on this will continue over time. Um, Thanks. Let's move on to the next item, which is um, cost of living initiatives for staff. And I, I saw recently today um, that there is a project team which has been established, which is uh, sounds uh, very positive. It's a project team, project lead with, uh, I think, two, two staff as well. And uh, people are being encouraged within the council to apply for that. But it's about... The the, con uh, the concrete um, initiatives that we're going to come up with in terms of assisting, supporting not only residents but also uh, members of staff who are finding it uh, increasingly difficult to make uh, ends meet uh, in today's extremely it's more than challenging situation, and uh, unfortunately, it's going to get worse with uh, cost of uh, food. Um, the cost of heating, lighting, et cetera, utility, utility. So it's about having some concrete support. It's, uh, uh, I think uh, a lot's been discussed about it. It's about the nuts and bolts of delivery. And I don't know if we're at that stage of you giving uh, uh, an update in terms of what, what we're considering or what the options are, because... Um, yeah, I don't know if we're too early in terms of infancy on that one. Go ahead, Steve. Yep. Um, well, absolutely. I think you've summed up the situation faced by people in work as well as not in work all around the all around the country. So I think we we're aware that for for good reasons, most of our uh, activity around the cost of living crisis to this point has been focused. I guess outwardly at, at residents, um, council um, declared a cost of living crisis um, at full council last week. So this is, you know, right at the top of our agenda. Um, so I think the two things we're looking. We clearly we, we have our usual range of employee assistance. Um, counselling support that would be there in the, in the normal course of events, but I think important to remind people that these things are there, and that, you know there, there's an unlimited access to them. Um, remind people, I think, of what um, Councillor Mason's just been saying about our commitment as a real living wage employer, both inside the organisation and in terms of the those parties with whom we deal, uh, remembering that many of our employees are residents of the borough. So, you know, our interaction with residents through our sort of cost of living hub through through our website um, should be will be relevant to them. Um, and also increasingly to, to draw people's attention Particularly those people at the lower end of the income scales to, to other benefits or or assistance that is in the normal course of events available to them to which they're they're entitled in work benefits support benefits in in advice services so uh, we're pulling those things together there'll be information available um on one space 
Um, and I think that will be growing out over the course of the, the coming days and weeks. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful, um, and we can we can also communicate that to staff as well. Um, I don't see anyone wishing to contribute, so we'll move on to the next uh, item, which is uh, inequality update. Obviously, um, we were at one stage looking at action plans for the the directorates. We are now in a different scenario with having six strategic directors and uh, directorates so um, it'd be helpful to get a, a brief update in terms of where we're at because have we gone back to the drawing board or are we uh, reviewing the work that's been undertaken and amending it according to the new structure basically and where we're at in terms of the plans and uh, the actions that we're 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 seeking to achieve is that your you up, Andrew, or is that Sue? Okay, so I'll just comment first of all, and then perhaps Sue wants to come in um, uh, afterwards. So, you know, reflecting. So, um, we are one organisation. You know, Ealing is as a council is one organisation, and I think the journey that we're trying to go on in terms of the values, culture, and, and leadership of the organisation is is that we 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 do behave in that way. So when we make a corporate commitment to fighting inequality, both externally of the council, but also internally, we want we want one response. Um, and that will be reflected in the work that happens both, um, you know, and when we say corporately, we're not we're not referring anymore to a corporate centre and the chief executive's department that sits aside from people in place. When we say corporately, we are referring to we're referring to everybody um, because everybody's got a joint responsibility and a joint um, stake in, in in all of this so it's definitely not the case of returning to the drawing board and starting again um, actually I think the work that's been happening through um, uh, uh, through the groups that have been have been brought together over the last um, two years ha has actually been very positive and just in the last month or two uh, I think we've seen a step change in the way that we um, consider these issues and equally the way in which we mark and celebrate significant moments and um, uh, of the council calendar, not least in terms of things that we've done in the last month alone, for example, the celebrations that happened during um, uh, Black History Month and any staff were at the um, rededication of the plaques and the um, the cultural event that we have that we had afterwards, you know, that was a testament to some uh, fantastic work by staff network groups coming together to support the activity um, that was taking place. Um, and of course, partly the commitment that we show internally is also reflecting the commitment we show externally with the sort of the creation and the mainstreaming of the Citizens Tribunal, which is it's very much about saying that we're not around to mark our own homework, but we need other people to be um, doing that. And if that's good for what we're doing externally to the organisation, that's good for what we're um, doing internally as well. Um, but I just thought I'd give that um, introduction first and I think if uh, who is coming in Sue are you coming Sue are you speaking on this yeah I, I, I I'm not sure I could put, have put it any better uh, than Councillor Mason has actually it's that one council feel actually bringing everything together in terms of a, a solid response right across and actually mobilizing everybody to take responsibility in terms of the culture and the way the organization behaves and conducts itself Clearly, there's some work to do. We don't want to lose any of the excellent work that's already been done around action planning, but clearly we want to align those because some of those actions are best carried out within services and across the organisation, not just from the top, but right the way throughout. So the work is ongoing, but it is, it's quite focused work now. And we're seeing some really good contributions from our Equalities Network. They're working well with us and very valuable contributions um, uh, for that so all, all good work going forward thank you sue um any other contributions no okay let's move on to the, the next item uh which is well-being and mental health um and which is equally as important as a cost of living crisis for uh, for staff as well and it's um you know it it is something that's affecting everyone. We're we're going through um, some difficult, tremendous, tremendously difficult times, um, and it's really about what uh, new and different initiatives we're going to come up with to um, to support staff. Obviously, you've got plans for 
residents as well, but um, and that's more with uh, working in partnership with uh, with other agencies as well. But it's it's really what we're doing in internally, which is uh, of interest to me. So I yeah. Get, yeah, again, I'll just sort of say a few words and I'll bring bring the team in. Um, yes, I mean, uh, I was reflecting on the London living wage conversation. I was with um, home care workers this morning, actually, um, just doing a little bit of work ahead of National Living Wage Week next week to actually ask questions about the impact that um, moving to the London living wage has had. And actually what, what you know, in, as part of the discussion with the site managers and, and sort of people who run the services, it's been awful, right? Not just because of cost of living, but also the consequences of the pandemic. And that's reflected in, of course, the everyday conversations that I'm sure we all have um, with service users and, and with people um, who are our, our friends and our colleagues. Um, but, you know, that's that's to do with the cost of living crisis. That's people facing huge increases in their rent and their mortgage costs and their bills with food prices being where they are. There is a lot of worry out there. Uh, and that comes off of the back of a period of, of national trauma, it has to be said. You know, I think we can't underestimate the impact that still remains um, from the pandemic and from and from lockdown again the discussion you know that there are um uh, those people in receipt of care for example who were um either you know, had special educational needs or for example had mental health disabilities were now in new routines that meant that that mean that they have very little exposure to the outside world that they're that for two year, for a two year period of various lockdowns their entire world's changed um, and now it's incredibly hard to break new habits and um, new routines. And so all of that demand is coming, yes, as you rightly point out earlier in the meeting, through adult social care in terms of the demands and the pressures that are on the service. But we can't underestimate equally um, the sort of the collective trauma that's still held by staff who are on the front line um, and staff who were, who were dealing with that situation. So I think we're we're collectively incredibly conscious of this, um, as I say, not just externally to the organisation, but internally as well. Um, and I think, again, it, it reflects, and we've not discussed it today, but I'm sure we will in future, but it equally reflects in the way in which we um, we provide support to staff. I'm sure the team will come in on specific projects, but also holistically about culture as well. So the how we work, where we work, how we interact with each other, the care and sort of I, I like to use the word because it's true the care and love that we sort of show to each other is is absolutely important to that and just our um, our day-to-day behaviors and on our interactions as well as we as we increase them but i do know the team are going to come in on some specifics that we're that we're rolling out so would you like to come in now yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, to add to that, I think that it's really important that we we position ourselves as a, as a good employer, an employer of choice, and make this a great place to work. And part of that is about the way people feel, the way they're treated, the interactions that they have day to day with their with each other and with their managers. And therefore, there's a lot of effort going into improving the induction for managers and supporting managers, focusing on leadership focusing on well-being, culture, values, ways of working in a way that really tries to shape the organisation and support people to work well and to work well together and to support them and face the challenges that they have. So, I mean, I think adding to what we've got on our uh, learning platform and looking at supporting managers to manage better, I think that's, that's a really quite a significant contribution to making this a great place to work. And looking again, I think you will have heard me speak before about developing a culture of kindness, the kind of culture where we, we think about each other, we support each other, and actually generally we recognise and value the contribution of individuals and teams. So this is a broad, really broad piece about people, people feeling good about coming to work and feeling that their contribution is valued and respected. So lots of lots of lots and lots of stuff happening uh, in pockets all across. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, perhaps we can take this offline in terms of yes. the actual initiatives. That yes. would be really helpful. And thank you, Peter, for your contribution here. Yes. Um, that concludes today's meeting. And, sorry, um, uh, Sigminder, I think Kemi had her hand up. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Kemi, go ahead. It's okay because you said we can take it offline. So I was just going to ask a question regarding the, the, the well-being. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm happy to do that. Yeah. yeah I, I, I read your mind there, Kemi. So I thought. 
<laughs> yeah, let's, let's, let's have a face-to-face -face meeting and uh, discuss it. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a good evening, what's left of it. Okay, thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.